just get started. Uh, thank you all for coming. Um, actually, I had a meeting yesterday that nobody showed up, and I was just like, I'll show them. And I pulled up a bag of stuffed animals and put on chairs and presented with them. Um, <laughs> for any from Sesame Street, have a couple of really good questions. So you all know, have to live up to that. Um, so this presentation, um, hi, I'm Kevin, by the way, if that isn't obvious already. I'm from Stetson University, which is in uh, Deland, Florida. It's about 45 minutes north of Orlando, about 20 minutes away from the ocean. Um, so kind of right in Central Florida area. And this presentation is based on a presentation that I will be doing for the Association for Institutional Research. Um, that presentation is going to be really like, hey, look at us, how awesome we are. Right? But as I was going through this one uh, and figuring out kind of what I wanted to talk about, I didn't want to just be like, hey, look at how awesome we are, because I don't really think that's as informative as it could be for you all. Um, I have a good program, you all have a good program. Um, so I didn't want to just be like, hey, here's a bunch of data. Yeah. Uh, so there is going to be data. Uh, I'll show you a little bit of the assessment that I'm doing. But instead of data driven, um, really, I, I wanted to focus more on like, the process of what we did in order to pilot our construction program and then kind of turn it over to you and talk about the program set and you wanted to pilot or you want to push forward and see if we can't work together to think of some solutions for you all to you know push for programs that you really want on your campus right so i'll be going over a couple of different things um, I'll be talking, I'll be giving you some context uh, as to kind of why we decided to pilot peer instruction at Stetson. Um, I'll go over a little bit of our assessment in our data. Uh, I'll go very briefly over our results and what happened, and then I'll give you some of the advice and some of the feedback that I would give you from someone who has piloted a program um, with very little funding, um, very little permanent funding even to start. I'll talk a little bit about how little funding we had and how we had to fund the program. Um, a little bit later, and then I'll turn it over, over to you if you have any questions or if you not, like I said, about the programs that you all want um, for your school. So, the process. Um, it really started with two meetings. Uh, one meeting was with a math faculty member and my boss and I. Uh, we were just sitting in my office um, and just kind of just talking, really. Uh, at the time, math had a supplemental leaders program, they called it, which is based on supplemental instruction, but it was really informal, uh, wasn't very, I mean, wasn't very well supported. They didn't have a full-time person to support it. They didn't have a staff member to support it. And kind of the faculty members decided one day, hey, this is a really cool program. Let's do it. And then they did it. Um, but that was kind of where it was. And so the math faculty member is talking to my boss, and the math faculty member was like, hey, you know what would be really cool? If we could have like a, a staff person take this over and offer more support. And my boss was like, yeah, that's a really good idea. And I swear to you, I swear to you, this happened. Like a really bad TV show. They looked at each other, and they both looked at me at the exact same time. And I'm like, great. Um, in fact, that back then I remember talking to me 15 minutes beforehand about how, like, hey, it's your like, third week on the job, don't, like, take on too much. Like, don't, you know, <laughs> add another program onto you, don't do anything like that. And then immediately afterwards, he throws me under the bus and gives me this program. So, um, you know, it ended up being a really good thing, but at the time I was like, oh, great, thank you, thank you so much. Um, I really just wanted to get started on the right foot, and now I have another program. So, um, so yeah, so that was kind of where this program sort of started, uh, and how it fell under my umbrella. And then I'd say a month later, I'm in another meeting with two faculty members, um, the now vice provost and uh, my director. And um, the faculty members were talking about a longitudinal study that they had done to, um, it was, I believe, in its third or fourth year, a pre and post test on introductory biology one. Uh, they had looked at what students were coming in with as far as biology knowledge, and they wanted to see uh, what they were leading the two, um, two section introductory biology course with. Right? So they wanted to track how, what their students were learning, and whether they were meeting the objectives that biology faculty members put out for them. Um, and they were really disappointed with the results. They saw that students were really good at like vocab and you know knowing what stuff was, but they really weren't very good at kind of higher order, higher level knowledge, uh, which is crucial for biology, right? 
uh, I mean, it's one thing to say, oh yeah, that's a fish. But it's another thing to say, you know, let's figure out how to study that fish. Let's figure out how to compare it to other fish in the same population or in these you know, different species of fish. Like what makes them different um, and that kind of thing. Yeah. So they were really disappointed that students weren't getting that higher order knowledge. Um, and they really wanted to push for more support for the program. Um, so we had this supplemental years program and we were like, hey, let's just expand it to biology one. Right? So that was kind of our focus coming in, is that we really wanted to focus just on Biology 1. Uh, it's the first class that students in Biology major take. Uh, it's mostly first semester freshman students. Some second semester students get pushed back just based on schedule. But it's mostly a first semester course. And um, you know, we, I mean, like I said, we didn't have any funding for this at all. In fact, we charged students for it. Every student paid $20. And that was how we funded the you know, supplemental, supplemental instruction, right? So um, I formalized the program a little bit. I renamed it Steps in Peer Instruction, or SPI, only because it sounded cool. Um, <laughs> literally, my entire thought process was that it was cool to have a SPI program and to have SPIs working for me. So that's kind of, so if you hear me say like SPI or sort of Steps in Peer Instruction, um, that's where that name comes from, literally sitting in my office one day, I was like, yeah, that's a cool name. I'm going to name my book from that, right? So from there, uh, we did a, you know, a semester and we wanted to look at assessment. And we did the traditional supplemental instruction assessment, right, where you take all of the students who were in, you know, who used supplemental instruction and you take all of the students who didn't and you compare them, right? And we saw that students who used the program did better than students who didn't, which is great. Right? But we wanted to dig a little bit deeper into the assessment. Um, we wanted to dig a little bit deeper into student outcomes. And it turns out Stetson has a metric that's created in-house um, called Calculated Index Score, or CI Score. Uh, CI Score is a number given to every single student when they come in. Uh, it's from 1 to 8. 1 is the best, 8 is the worst. Um, and it is uh, based on a student's high school GPA, their high school class rank, their high school test, sorry, the quality of their high school and their standardized test scores. And what this metric was designed to do is it was designed to look at um, outcomes of students who had different levels of preparation coming into Stetson, right? You have one who probably are our best students who retain the best, who have the best GPAs, and then we have our eights who are, uh, you know, not maybe didn't go to as good of a high school, maybe don't have the, the, the same quality of standardized test score, maybe don't have the same GPA level, right? And we wanted to look at this and we wanted to split students um, by CI score, so looking at different you know, levels of students, if you will, right? So we see overall that the program impacts students, but we wanted to see whether it was just impacting students at the top, whether it was impacting students at the bottom, whether it was impacting students in the middle, and so on and so forth. What we've seen in the program in the past is that students, who, most of the students who use our program have above a 3.0, right? Our best students use our support programs. Our best students go to tutoring, which is great as far as looking at outcomes because they have the highest GPA, so they just, they just look really good on graphs. But if not as good, you know, theoretically, when you're trying to support students, you want to hit the students, you know, not the students at the top. They're going to be probably okay but we wanted to hit the students in the middle and towards the bottom, mm -hmm. right? So I did an assessment, um, and this is what I came up with. Um, I split students <coughs> into, like I said, three groups, three turntile, um, the highest performing students, uh, middle performing students, and lowest performing students. Um, I grouped them by number of visits, so here are the students who had zero visits, um, and then the students who had between one and nine visits, and then finally the students who went 10 or more times. Um, roughly about once per week. Um, so we saw some really great results. Um, I mean, sample size was obviously a concern. Uh, this is based on six um, sections of about 40 people a piece. So we're looking at actually after uh, you know working through all of the data, we ended up with about 192 students. Uh, Stetson is a very small campus. If you didn't know, it's about 3,000 students total. Um, you know, so there are some classes you know at other larger institutions that are larger than an entire sample size for two semesters worth of data. So we're still we're still working with some sample size, and it'll probably be about two more years before we can really get this data. But 
Um, we saw some really good results starting out. Uh, we're not so sure about what this is. We're not so sure about what this is. But we generally saw that students who attend our, you know, our program, you know, irregardless of, excuse me, regardless of, you know, where they, how, what they come in with, and regardless of, you know, their standardized test scores and their GPAs and all of that, um, they generally do better when they use our program, right? And I sent this to the vice provost, and she was just like, this is the best thing I have ever seen. And I was like, I did it. <laughs> I did it in Excel. Like, what? Right? And she was like, I mean, thank you, but okay. Um, and she was like, no, this is great, right? Because look at this. The students at the lower end who we predict aren't going to have as good outcomes, who aren't going to retain as well, who aren't going to have as good of a GPA, who use our program a lot, end up with better GPAs than the students at the top who don't use our program at all. Right? And she's like, she, you know, this is something that's really you know, meaningful for her. Because she's like, I, I, I want students to have agency. I want students to have choice. I want students to you know, have control over their academic, you know, future in their academic series deficit. And you're telling me that students at the lower end can do just as well as students at the upper end if they just use our program, if they just use the, social, the support that we offer. Like, this is amazing. I'm going to share this with everybody. And she did. She shared it with everybody. Right? Because this is, you know, students who use this, you know, students need to see this. They need to see, like, you know, what kind of students you want to be. You know, maybe you didn't come in, you feel like you're maybe a little bit less prepared coming into school and use our program, and your GPA goes up tremendously. Right? So she loves this, and she shares it with everyone, and I actually um, split this group up, uh, the one to nine, I actually split it in half in one, um, and just to see what it would look like. And she's like, that, don't, that doesn't look like yeah. So, uh, don't do that. <laughs> um, so, uh, so yeah, so this is the kind of what we came up with as far as, you know, how our intervention was going for student. Um, we saw really great results coming in. And we were able to leverage these results um, into a gigantic expansion of our program, you know, relative to Stetson at least. Um, I mean, we started out literally with just enough funding for a couple of math courses and four sections of Biology 1. We found funding for Biology 2 in the second half of that year. Uh, we expanded the program into um, Introduction to Logic, which is actually the hardest course at Stetson, amazingly, out of nowhere, Logic. Um, students cool. do very poorly in Logic. And we expanded the program to offer support for them. We expanded the program to offer support for Organic Chemistry, which is a traditionally a very difficult course. right? Um, and we're looking at offering uh, next semester adding um, Intro of, uh, sorry, um, anatomy and physiology one and two, and we're looking at adding general chemistry as well. Right, so we were able to leverage just this, which you know it's just an Excel. You know, I pulled in all of our usage data, and I pulled in uh, grades, and I looked, pulled in CI score, and I ran a you know a chart, and this got us all of that. Right. So, what advice can I give you? based on what I've done through so far. Like, know the people you know. Right? I, like, I'd love to be like, yeah, you know, I, I knew the vice provost was really into agency and really into local control, and I really I knew that she did, you know, wanted this kind of, these kind of interventions. I didn't. I didn't. I lucked into this, right? Like, I got really lucky. I'm very willing to admit that. But you don't have to be. You know, if you know what, you know, the people on your campus who make things happen, um, if you know what they if they want, you know what they're looking for. Like, can you be a part of that? Right. I, I found something that you know a vice provost was very interested in, and now my program will probably have funding for a long long time. Um, you know that's really where I went for that. So find the people who have the power, find the people who have the control, and find people who want to work with you, and really push to work with them. Right. Kind of on the same kind of wavelength is find allies as well, right? One of the faculty members who I worked with in the biology department, uh, Alicia Slater, has been just a tremendous, tremendous help, right? And she came in and she was like, I really want to help students. Uh, she had read a, a recent document called Just Need to Change um, that focused on how we were teaching undergraduate biology students. 
right, and looking at the outcomes at a national level and saying, look, we need to change. We need to change how we teach biology because students aren't getting what they need to in order to do better and you know, do well in biology. We need to change that. So she flipped her classroom. She did all sorts of different things. You know, she had seen in the past that students weren't doing as well in the classes she wanted them to. Right? They were in between C's and C pluses, and she's like, I will give a student the grade that they earn. I want them to earn better grades. I want them, you know, and after doing this, adding this intervention, her grade spiked. Right? I mean, students did significantly better. And so, you know, she wanted this kind of intervention. She wanted something hands-on. She wanted peer-to-peer. -peer. She wanted that level of support for students. Right? And she had been just a tremendous asset, you know, in terms of data analysis, not Excel spreadsheets, but you know, even beyond that. Um, you know, in introducing other data points and, you know, really has been just a wonderful person to work with, you know. So these are the people who can make or break your program, right? At Stetson, our faculty members are very, very involved. And I found, you know, a faculty member who wanted to do this and it has done so much for our program, right? And the third thing that I would say is leverage the data that you have. And I put you in quotes. Because some of the data is stuff that you actually have, and some of it is data that your institution has. Right? You all have usage data. I mean, you do. You all track usage. Like everybody at some point tracks the usage, right? And you can probably get GPA data pretty pretty easily. But your institutional research office has a lot of great stuff. Right? They have a, like our institutional research office has CI score that was created in house by us. Right? I use that to show what the difference is in, in intervention between students at you know, a higher level of uh, performance in high school and students at a lower level. Right? So that's something I pulled in. Um, a lot of other you know, offices and a lot of our other departments on campus have other data. Um, one of the things, one of the reasons why I'm really excited about offering support for general chemistry, um, you know, besides to actually support students and all of that, which is, you know, obviously number one, is because general chemistry at Stetson has a standardized final. And not a standardized, like, two Stetson final. They use the American Chemical Society standardized final for general, general chemistry. And I heard that, and I could have just fallen over. Right? Because this, you know, all of the tests we do, all of the comparisons between classes, you know, these are faculty members writing their own tests. And uh, I mean, there's some standardization and some, you know, between faculty members, but to a certain extent, you know, it is their tests. And they are kind of testing what they feel is important. Whereas, you know, for general chemistry, every single student for their final takes the exact same test. And they've taken the exact same standardized test for years. Right? If I wanted to look at the difference between this year and compare it to last, you know, if we get this intervention, it'd be better. But if we get this intervention, <laughs> if we get the funding, um, I, you know, we can look at this semester's data versus you know last semester, and we can look at that um, on a standardized test. So I'm just like, that's amazing, and they have this data sitting here, right? So you know, use the data you have, talk to people, figure out what you've got, and figure out what you can do to do assessment with that kind of data. So, and that's all that I have, really. Um, I wanted to give, obviously, my contact, but I also wanted to open up the floor to you all and you know, see if I have and can answer any questions, or to see if you all are planning anything and see if you know, people in this room can give you some advice or some tips or anything like that. This is my experience. Every other people here have had other similar experiences. And I want to you know, make sure that we use all of the knowledge, which is kind of why we're here. Right? Good question. <clears throat> you said the biology was using flipped instruction or the flipped classroom model. Mm -hmm. How does the flipped classroom model differ from what you're doing in SI? It does and it doesn't, right? So the, um, it turns out SI works really well with the flipped classroom model. Right, because the faculty member is designing their own, you know, many lectures online. They're doing many lectures in class. They're designing a lot of that. But um, you know, RSI leaders aren't just sitting there in class. They're actually like bouncing around and answering questions. So um, in the first semester, where Dr. Um, Dr. Slater flipped her classroom, uh, she had a, she had a section of 72 people, which for Stetson is insane. Like, it is absolutely insane. You don't have 72 people per 
person classes, right? And she had two leaders, um, two spies in her class, and they did pretty much the exact same thing she did during the class. They bounced around, they answered questions. Um, she said, you know, there's so many people at end of class that lined up to talk to me that they would like take the back of the line and I would take the front of the line, so the doctor's later speaking. And she's like, I would talk to people and then I'd see like them talking to people and answering questions and offering support and that kind of thing. So in some ways it didn't differ, um, but they still offered the traditional, you know, outside of class support of the sessions, if you will. Um, so it ended up being something that meshed really well with her teaching pedagogy. And um, when it came time to make the sessions interactive, the students were actually prepared for that. Right? Instead of going from this lecture-based class to you know interactive spy session, they went from an interactive class to interactive spy session. So it actually kind of prepared them to be you know engaged during those sessions. Right? So when the spy would do things and they would be interactive with the 20 people who came to a session, you know everybody was into it. Right? So it worked really well with that. Yeah. Sure. I think something uh, you mentioned earlier about uh, getting to that high level order thinking for students, like when reading a biology book, and you know, biology is very conceptual, so something that students need to keep in mind is understanding reading strategies to help them understand the content better. Mm -hmm. Because normally, when we do the bio workshops, and for us tutors, it's maybe up to 10 students, you have students that say, I sit in the library and I read for three hours straight. Mm -hmm. But that's not going to help you obtain any information afterwards. <clears throat> so what we do is, is you need to know their learning style first when you know they're going through their text. So one of the things we tell them to get to a higher level, level order is you know through the workshops like Bloom's Taxonomy, right? Like in the public school system, they only get to about one through three on Bloom's, and when you start talking about four, five, and six, the freshman college students they have no idea what you're talking about. So you have to come up with a certain scenario so they can make that connection. Like, oh, this is how that's going to help me understand biology. And we have you know two thousand, three thousand students in the data and it shows that when they come in for TLC for five five sessions, they have to come to all five, then they get then they get the extra credit. And it shows that those students who take it pass biology, those who don't are less likely to pass biology. So integrating those reading strategies really helps with the exam prep as they utilize study guides too. want to do, what do you all want to push for? There is something that I want to push for, and that is um, recognizing that um, in my library and learning commons is also where we house all of our developmental education classes, and sometimes you see that distraught student who's saying, you know, and I say, you know, she's like, can I talk to you? And you know, she's in tears, and I'm like, what's going on? And um, she say she's repeating a math course um, for the second time. And I really want to think about instituting some kind of program that would help the repeaters, those mm -hmm. students who, if they go through it one more time, they're probably out of there. Yeah. Um, but I want to be able to secure funding from those above for what I want to pilot. Um, so I, I found this instructive in terms of thinking about how I might convince them that it's a worthy cause and <laughs> getting the funding. So I, I feel like I need, you know, funding for the staffing because I, I wanted mm -hmm. to do kind of like a supplemental instruction, but it's targeting that particular population um, of students a little bit more intense with assistance than they would receive even because they have access to tutoring and stuff now. But I sometimes think that perhaps another component would help to bolster um, you know, their success in the courses and then also perhaps integrating with that some kind of a mentoring component or help with like study skills because sometimes I think it boils down to, to anxiety because they come to you and say, I already failed this once and so they're already you know, in that mindset that I can't do this. Yeah. I mean, I would say, I didn't mention it here because I was kind of focusing on the program broadly, but we've had a lot of success with really charismatic, really outgoing leaders as far as getting attendance and getting people engaged with the program. Right? We've had, we have, I know, two or three leaders who are really, really engaging, really, you know, really interactive, and students really um, kind of connect with them. And that's what, that, that makes this program work really well. In fact, um, I mean, I, I don't say this because faculty members don't kind of 
they want to hear it, but they don't. But I, mean, I, want, I will take a charismatic student, an outgoing student, an engaging student who got a B plus in the course over a quiet student who isn't as engaging and doesn't get, connect to people who got an A plus. Mm -hmm. I think I will. And I think students connect to those students. I think they come back to those students. I think that those students are better as mentors and better as we engage, you know, to engage. What this side from? <laughs> you know, well, something we want to push for is uh, now that we have our TOC Bio 1 and Bio 2 lined up, because those are you know open to the general bio students, it doesn't have to be a specific GPA. So we launched an ASP chemistry program that has these students that are on academic probation. We try to bring them up, putting continuary, uh, discipline, continuary literacy with disciplinary literacy, and the numbers have been coming along really well. So then the next thing that happens was all these departments, right? Bio one comes back to us saying, hey, we really like what you did, you know, for the general students, how about we get an ASP biology? Mm -hmm. And then other departments start buying into it. And then, you know, my, my reading and learning coordinator will tell us, hey, you know, um, the SEPA department, the for school, school for International Public Affairs, they want to jump in on it. So my question to you is, how would you, I guess, try to convince faculty members? that maybe that don't buy into what you're doing to try to be a part of the program and, and, and part of expanding, sure. if that makes sense. I mean, I guess part of it depends on your faculty culture, mm -hmm. right? Like our faculty are very engaged in everything. And that's, I mean, I hear a lot of people you know, talking, hey, I really want to get faculty engaged and faculty, you know, to connect. Um, for us, it's that everybody, all of our faculty are connected. So, you know, it's trying to find the right ones to work with. Um, to that, I would say, that's a, that's a tricky one. I mean, you've got data that says it works really well. Be persistent. Be persistent. Um, the other thing you can think about, uh, are you, do you currently have faculty members who are engaged with the program? Mm -hmm. You can leverage that. Mm -hmm. Because you might be this kind of this academic affairs, East student affairs, bean counter who doesn't know anything about anything and what is that? That's an MED after your name? What is that? No, that's nothing. Um, you know, but other faculty, you know, but other faculty members can, you know, help that, help that process along. Having a faculty member be engaged with the program is crucial. You know, you can just at the most basic level to convince other faculty members that this was the program that was worth it. Mm -hmm. Right? Um, and that was also really useful because, you know, when some we, you know, like for a check-in, like when I check in with faculty members, I'm like, hey, how's the program going? And they're like, great. But a faculty member at a faculty meeting who checks in with other faculty members to really talk about the program and where it is and where it's going can be, you know, another conversation altogether. Mm -hmm. I learned from one of those meetings with, you know, with Dr. Slater or home with other biology faculty members that some of them were like, what is this program? Like, like what is our purpose for this program? That kind of thing. So that changed the conversation a little bit. Mm -hmm. I kind of just said, hey, here's a program. You know, and they were like, what do I have to do here? Like, what do you want me to do? Like, what is my role here? So I didn't even think to talk about that. So I took a step back, had that conversation as well. So leveraging your faculty connections that you currently have and leveraging the data that you currently have. Cool. No matter who they are, all faculty members want students to be successful. I mean, they do. They absolutely 100% do. I think too, if you have students, I mean, you can leverage faculty that you know or know the ones that are going to be engaged because you're going to have those, but mm -hmm. also listening to your students. I mean, because if a student comes in and says, you know, this faculty meets with me after class and they hold office hours, they hold study review sessions, then that student is telling you, okay, they're going to be engaged. They might not be engaged with you, right. but they're engaged with the students. Right. Um, and then having students approach faculty members that are you know, more disengaged um, or appear to be to on our end. Mm -hmm. But having those students go to those faculty that aren't necessarily kind of, you know, up front and them saying, hey, you know, I'm doing this in another class. Would you be on board? I might be your leader. Mm -hmm. um, and so then they're doing it for the students and they're not doing it for you. Um, and, you know, it's kind of a, a back door to get into their heart. Mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> they, they, they might not like me, but they definitely love the students they work with. And I'm sure in a smaller school setting, it's right. a lot easier mm -hmm. compared to 45, 50,000. Yes. <laughs> yeah. mm -hmm. yeah. mm -hmm. Any questions?
question. So your your title is what? My title is an academic success coordinator. I coordinate uh, our tutoring and supplemental instruction programs. And what kind of da other data do you gather? Mm -hmm. Since you're more data oriented, what kind of data do you gather? What other kind of data do we gather? I think. I, it's for me at least, if not the data that I gather, it's, it's leveraging the, the other data that we have that we can bring in as far as demographics and other kind of levels of analysis. Um, so I, I collect usage data. Like that's, that is pretty much all that I collect. But the university collects so much more. So I use, I use Access. Um, if you don't know how to use Access, Access and SQL have saved my life. Right. Like I get, like I have, I think four data sets, and I just pull in different parts of each data. And since they all have student ID on them, I just say for this student ID, pull in how many visits they have, pull in their SAT score, pull in this, you know, or their CI score, pull in everything else that we have, and it'll just put it in one spreadsheet, and I can copy paste that in to Excel. So for me, it's leveraging the data we have, right? which can be, I mean, a little daunting. But there's just so much out there. There's so many interventions that your college has already done. There's so many, you know, assessments that they've done. Um, you can, you know, pull that data, find that data, and use it. Any question? And thank you very much for coming. Um, if you have any, if you have any other questions. Um, I actually did not pull, put my email address on anywhere here. I just realized that. So I'm just going to type it right here. And, <laughs> and, um, so I am krmiller at stetson.edu. So if you do have any questions or you'd like to send me an email I, or give me a ring, I will be happy to help.